So Great Basin National Park Foundation is the nonprofit partner of Great Basin National Park. And our purpose is to foster people's connection with Great Basin National Park so its wonder is protected and preserved for future generations. And a lot of the stuff that we support at the park is around the astronomy theme. For example, the wonderful speaker who you'll be hearing from, um, we support her position and we support a lot of other things. But I would love for you to learn more. Um, come to our websites. Come check out greatbasinfoundation.org or the greatbasinobservatory.org. Um, to learn more, you could sign up for a newsletter. Um, and we'd just love to have you um, be a little bit part of our community. So Serena, who is our speaker tonight, she currently works on the astronomy team at Great Basin National Park. And she's doing that through the Scientists in the Parks Internship Program. And what she does is she helps to run the park astronomy programs. She also does cave tours and other park activities. So. She's really neat. She's going to be a lot of fun. Um, she's spent her summer so far in Nevada, but she's originally from New Jersey, and she currently goes to college at Harvard. And she studies astrophysics and earth sciences at Harvard University. So although she loves the East Coast, she loves nothing more than stargazing under the dark Nevadan skies. And she can't wait to share her experience with you today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Serena. Thank you so much. Awesome, so thank you Aviva for that wonderful introduction. And also thank you Vicky for that introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So just to confirm, can everybody see that same title slide we were seeing before? Incredible. Also, I see in the chat that somebody's from New Jersey and can I just say, wow, that is incredible. Um, but yes, my name is Serena. I am currently in Great Basin National Park. And today I'm really excited to take you on something of a journey through this national park and the night skies that we protect. But before we get started, and pardon me while I change the slide, um, we do need to go through some community norms that I'd like us all to uphold throughout our hour together. So to begin, Please do keep yourself muted during this virtual field trip unless we specifically tell you that you can unmute. In addition, if you do have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature. Um, we'll do our best to address those. Once again, uh, no drawing or writing on the screen. And finally, there will be opportunities throughout our time together to participate. And we truly do want to hear from you or from you. So make sure to participate and stay engaged. All right. so. Before we go any further, I see that people are typing in the chat already where they're coming in from. So if everybody else wants to go ahead, type in the chat where you're here at right now, um, I'd love to get a sense of where everyone is. It looks like we have people from all over, from, let's see, Texas, New Jersey, Tennessee, Japan, uh, Kentucky, DC, Florida, Connecticut, Colorado, California, Anchorage, Hawaii, Arizona, um, and the list just goes on. So truly all over the world. And so that is incredible. That is the beauty of the internet. Um, and also insane props to everybody in a different time zone from myself. But like I said, I'm currently here at Great Basin National Park in Eastern Nevada. And that's me a few weeks ago in the park. But I didn't start here. I spent my summer here, but I started in New York City. So that's me as a kid in New York City. You can see the skyline behind me. And so I did not grow up here in Great Basin National Park, nor did most of the other park rangers working here or our visitors. But we do have a lot of animals in the park who have spent their whole lives here, who have grown up here, and who will eventually you know, die here. They just spend their whole lives here. So here's a family of kit foxes. You can see three baby kit foxes right in the center and then the mama kit fox. And this picture was taken a few winters ago in the national park. And kit foxes are not the only wildlife we have here. We've got yellow-bellied marmots. Um, this little guy was very curious. We also have butterflies. We have mule deer. We have all sorts of wildlife. 
and the wildlife is not the only living things that our park protects. We also have wildflowers here. So these are all pictures taken from this season, from the summer. On the left, we have some Colorado columbines. The center are some lupins. And on the right, there are Paris primrose. And these are just a little tiny selection of the wildflowers that our park has. Um, personally, I love the wildflowers here. And the difference between all of these living things that we've seen so far in our park is that they all have different lifetimes. They are all born here. They all live here. But these wildflowers will only live for a single season, for a single summer. The kit foxes, they only live for about five and a half years. And here at Great Basin, we have some of the single oldest living organisms on Earth. So that means we have some of the living things that have a single lifetime for the longest. And those are bristlecone pine trees. A single bristlecone pine tree can live for up to 5,000 years, right? So we as humans, we only live for about 100 years if we're lucky. This tree lives for 50 times that long. And so we have all sorts of living things that the park protects. And that is not the only thing that our park protects. We protect all sorts of non-living things, such as caves. We hear this is a picture of Lehman Caves, um, which if you ever visit Great Basin National Park in person, you should take a tour of. We also have lakes, we have mountains, but my favorite natural resource that our park has and that we protect is the night sky. And so here, this is that actually that same bristlecone pine I showed you a picture of before in the bottom left corner. And up above it is pretty much what our night sky looks like every night when we step outside. It's really beautiful. And one of the features that we can see from our park, because our skies are just so dark, is this band of light running across the sky, and that's called the Milky Way. So I'd love to get a sense of you all. So if we can launch a poll, I'd like you to click yes if you've ever seen the Milky Way yourself before and click no if you've never had the chance. Let's see, let's see what our numbers look like. All right. Looks like everyone's voting. We'll give everybody a minute to respond. All right. And just to check in on the technology front, would we, uh, would we be able to share the results with everybody? Um, it looks like of the people who have voted so far, 44% said yes, but the majority, 56%, said no, you've never seen the Milky Way in the night sky before. And that's actually really common. Um, it's, I grew up never seeing the Milky Way. And in most urban areas where there's a lot of light, we can't see the Milky Way. There's just too much light in the atmosphere blocking our view. But you're a great basic. You talk about the Milky, all, Milky Way all the time. And I'd like to explain to you what we're actually seeing when we look at the Milky Way. And if I had to put one word on what we were seeing, it would be, our galaxy. We're looking at the plane of our own galaxy that we live in. But what's a galaxy? A galaxy is basically just a huge collection of gas and dust and stars floating through space. It's kind of like our ecosystem, the same way that those trees and those animals live within Great Basin National Park. Our sun and all of us humans on Earth live within the ecosystem of our Milky Way galaxy. But galaxies come in all different shapes and sizes. So on the top left, we can see this big spiral-shaped structure. That's called a spiral galaxy. We also see on the bottom left this little blob of, of stars. That's called an elliptical galaxy. It's a different type of galaxy. And galaxies can come in all different shapes, sizes. They can be all sorts of interesting patterns. But the galaxy that we're going to focus on right now is in the bottom right corner. And that's called the needle galaxy. So let's see, looks like my mouse is froze, but this is called the needle galaxy. And 
this galaxy is an edge on spiral galaxy. So it's like we took that galaxy that we have at the top left corner, which we call the Rolko galaxy, and that's my hand is that galaxy. And then we're going to flip that galaxy 90 degrees until we see the edge of the galaxy rather than the front face. And that's what we see when we look at that galaxy right there. And so we're going to move that galaxy over to the side and we're going to zoom in on one of the arms of this galaxy. All right, so just to be very clear, that little box is highlighting the part that we're zoomed in on in the bigger box. So once everyone gets that, we're actually going to get rid of the whole galaxy because we only care about that zoomed in part. We're also going to flip the picture around just so it's easier to see. And then I would like to show you another picture of the Milky Way taken right in front of our visitor center where I'm sitting right now in Great Basin National Park. Looks pretty similar, doesn't it? And that's because when we look at the Milky Way in Great Basin National Park, or maybe for about half of you who have seen the Milky Way before in the night sky, as you look up at that band of light stretching across the sky, you're looking at the plane of our galaxy, at the plane of the Milky Way. And like I said, this is pretty much what the Milky Way and the night sky looks like from our park. It really is incredible so many stars, all sorts of different night sky objects stretched out above us. But I've already told you a few times now, this is not what I grew up with. I grew up with a night sky that looked like this. This is actually a picture that my sister, her name is Sylvie, she took this picture three or four weeks ago from pretty much my backyard. And that be of that line of light right in the center, that is actually New York City. We live right outside of the city. And that bubble of lighter sky on top of New York City is light pollution. It's light coming from New York City that gets scattered into our atmosphere and blocks our view of the stars. And as in any other form of pollution, light pollution can be harmful. But I'd like to get a sense of how it can be harmful. So I have another question for you and we should have another poll. So why don't you vote on how you think that light pollution can be harmful? And go ahead, take a minute to read the options. Register a vote. You can choose multiple options. All right like votes are coming in. We'll get them to keep coming in, give you another minute to vote, and then we'll check in and see how people answered. All right. So here are the results, you can see them. It looks like people voted most of all for the top and the bottom option. So animal migration patterns and light pollution can make us lose our connection to the night sky. But it looks like more than half of you voted for every single option. So good job to more than half of you because indeed light pollution can be harmful in all of these different ways. It's all of the above, exactly. So light pollution, can harm animal migration patterns. It also messes with our own natural sleep schedule as humans. It wastes electricity. If you're using extra light that you don't need, you're burning that electricity that you also don't need. And finally, light pollution makes us lose our connection to the night sky. It's the reason why half of us have never been lucky enough to see the Milky Way. But unlike other forms of pollution, light pollution is a special type of pollution. And that is related to the next question I have for you. So let's say I go into New York City into the main power grid and I cut all the power and there's a blackout and there's no light left in New York City. How long do you think it would take for this light pollution to completely disappear and all of that glow that you see in this picture to fade? So we have another poll question for you. Your options are A, 10 seconds, B, 10 minutes, 
C, 10 hours, or D, 10 days. So go ahead, respond to that, and let's see what people think. Looks like most of you have voted and you can see the results now. So looks like the majority of you have settled for maybe 10 minutes, 10 hours, but the results are pretty scattered. However, the least amount of you guessed it would be take only 10 seconds for light to disappear. And here's the thing. The answer is A, 10 seconds. So if we were to cut all of the power in New York City, all of that light would just disappear in under 10 seconds, it would take about 8.2 seconds for the Milky Way to become visible from downtown New York City. And you are all from different areas throughout the country and throughout the world. So this isn't just New York City. This could be your home city where you grew up. If all the power there died, it would only take eight seconds to get a view of the night sky, like what I've showed you in pictures of Great Basin. And just to drive that point home, I have another picture, and this is one used a lot by the International Dark Sky Association, which is basically just a big organization that works to make dark skies. And so on the left hand side, we have the way a light looks and the night sky looks normally at night above this person's house. And then all of a sudden there's a blackout in this person's neighborhood. And the owner of the house ran outside and grabbed a second picture after the blackout. And you can see before you could see maybe three, four, five, ten 10 stars in the night sky. But after that blackout, you can see the Milky Way stretching above this person's house. It's the same Milky Way that we were talking about before. The one that you've seen pictures of, the one that is the plane of our galaxy. And in general, light pollution is prevalent everywhere, not just in large cities, but it's also the type of pollution where the moment that you do anything to reduce the amount of light you're putting in the atmosphere, you can see the night sky better from home, anywhere you are. And so the next thing that I would like to ask you is actually something for you to type in the chat. Can you type in the chat for me how you can reduce your own light pollution at home, how you can stop putting light into the air? So we're going to give you about a minute to type in the chat your ideas for how you think that you can reduce light pollution. All right, I see people already starting to respond, but we'll give everybody time to type. All right, it looks like a lot of people are saying to turn off outside lights, um, maybe at a certain time, like once it gets dark. Turn off lights when you leave a room, so also turning off inside lights. Burning candles at home, that'll, have, that'll make less light for sure. Only use nights when you need to. These are all great answers. Let's see what else. Um, Tinting windows, maybe blocking the light that you have inside from going outside. So you could tint windows or maybe using curtains. I see somebody saying purchase IDA approved light fixtures. That's a great point. Maybe use lights that are better for the night sky somehow. Insta install lighting that points down instead of up. That same concept of changing your lights so it has less impact dark curtains. All right, so we've given everybody a lot of time to type their answers and you brainstormed a lot of things that the park actually does and that people do exactly to reduce light pollution. So here at Great Basin National Park, we also do our absolute best to reduce how much light we put in the atmosphere in order to keep our skies dark. And so we do things like 
we turn off our lights when we're not using them. Exactly what a lot of you suggested. Um, we also get rid of the lights we don't need. We don't need that extra light on the side of the building. We only need the lights that illuminate a step that we might trip over or show us a path. Um, but we also do a few things that either were not suggested or were suggesting much less. One of the most important things we do is we do this thing called shielding the lights. And that basically means we put a hat over the lights. So the light, any outside light will point down, but it's not pointing up into the air. That's something anybody can do. You can just put protection over your lights to stop that light from going up. Another thing that we do is we use red lights. So here in the picture behind our bubble of things that we do, we have our visitor center and the way it looks at night. You can see all of these lights are red. They're not white. They're not bluish, they're red. Now, the reason why that they're red is because the bluer a light is, the more it's going to impact your light, your night vision, the harder it will be to see the sky. So the redder a light is, the less it impacts it. Now, I'm not telling you all to go home and to change all of your light bulbs to red lights. I've actually had several people already this summer tell me that our park lighting looks, mur and they said the word murderous. Your neighbors may not appreciate you using red lights but consider switching your lights to more of an amber color. That amber color, which is just a reddish glow or an orange glow, doesn't look quite as murderous, doesn't look quite as extreme, but will still make an impact. Or tonight, go outside and look around your house or your apartment and think, do I need all of these lights? And turn off the ones you don't need. But maybe when you stumble up on a light, you see it and you think, I need that light. If that light's not on, I'm going to trip over that porch stair that I always miss. We're not asking you to turn that light off, you need it, but consider swapping it to a motion sensor. And here's the catch. If you start swapping your lights out, turning them off, putting them on a motion sensor, you are also going to be saving electricity, saving that money that you would usually be spending on lighting up things you don't need. And that's just the beginning. You can also teach all of your neighbors about light pollution and tell them, hey, maybe you don't need that outside light on. And once you do that, your neighborhood will start getting darker and darker and you'll start being able to see the night sky. And so once you're already outside, going around your house, looking at your light, seeing what you can turn off, why not go a step further and look up? And so wherever you are, you don't need to be at Great Basin National Park in order to enjoy the night sky on your own. So for the next five or so minutes, I'd like to walk you through the way I like to look up at the night sky to stargaze and also what you may see when you do so. First of all, I always like bringing a blanket because blankets are great to lie down on. They're also great to stay warm because it does get colder at night. I also always bring snacks because I always get hungry at night and snacks are just great in general. I also bring a red light, and that is the most important thing because I already mentioned any white light can ruin your night vision. And when red light, or I'm sorry, when white light ruins your night vision, it can take your eyes 20 to 30 minutes to adjust to this darkness again and be able to see the stars. So I only ever use red light when I'm stargazing. And finally, uh, some of you may have received this in a package. A planisphere tells you. It's basically a big circle and it tells you the locations of night sky objects and what you're seeing in the night sky. And so get all of this stuff together, get your blanket, your snacks, your red light, a planisphere, but where to go? Well, anywhere dark, consider going to a local park or your backyard or anywhere that might not have a street light shining right down at you. And then once you head out to that spot, it can take your eyes 20 to, it actually takes your eyes 20 to 30 minutes to adjust. I apologize for that slight typo on my slide. And so be patient. You won't see all of the stars the moment you start looking up. Give your eyes time to adjust. Now I see a question in the chat that says, what's the green thing? I assume in the picture, that green thing is a laser pointer. So oftentimes that park guided astronomy program, this picture in particular, I think was taken at Canyonlands National Park, 
um, at Park Guided Astronomy Programs, we also have green laser pointers to show you what we're looking at in the night sky. But I'm going to do my best without a green laser pointer right now to show you some of the things you may be looking at. Once you get to your park, you have your blanket snacks and have given your eyes time to adjust. So you may see constellations and constellations are basically any sort of collection of stars in the night sky. Here we have Cassiopeia in the bottom left corner that is a constellation. And then we have these two other patterns above it, one in the center and one on the upper right. These are called asterisms. They're kind of like constellations that aren't formally acknowledged, but that everybody recognizes. So in the top right hand corner, we have the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper has some of the brightest stars in the night sky. So even where I grew up in New York City and where all of you are right now, you should be able to see the Big Dipper at night. And so I have a trick to teach you. That is the first stargazing trick I ever learned and that I want you to all practice when you're stargazing. So once you find the Big Dipper, it should be pretty much right above you and it will make the pattern that you see in the upper right corner. Now that pattern is of a ladle. So on the right, you have the handle and on the top, you have the, the bowl, the scoop, and it's actually upside down in this picture. But you're going to go to that ladle, so the scooper bit, and you're going to go to those two left stars on it, the ones that are labeled as Merrick and Dubé. And you're going to follow Merrick to Dubé and you're going to multiply that distance by five. And you're going to follow that line five times that distance until you get to the star known as Polaris. Polaris is the North Star. It's a star that a lot of us are familiar with. And it's a star that is always in the same location in our sky. It always points north. And so once you do that, you've just oriented yourself not only to the night sky, but to the rest of the world. You know the direction of north. And so as you're stargazing, see if you can find the North Star. But as you're looking up at the night sky, trying to find Polaris, looking at the constellations, there's a lot of other objects that you're going to see. You're going to see satellites. Satellites look like these points of light. They almost look like stars only they're moving across the sky at a pretty steady rate. They look a little bit like planes, except they're not blinking. They have no blinking lights. And they're super common once you start looking for them. You're also going to see shooting stars or what we call meteors. Uh, those you see the longer you look up at the night sky. And actually next week or two weeks from now, is one of the biggest meteor showers of the year. So if you go stargazing in two weeks, you may see even more meteors shooting stars than usual. You'll also see planets. As the sun is setting, look right near where the sun's setting and you should see what looks like a really bright star. That's Venus, that's the second planet from the sun. You'll also see Jupiter and Saturn on the exact opposite side of the sunset about an hour after the sun sets. And those look like two very bright stars, but they're not stars at all, they're planets. And so that brings me to the end of what I have to tell you. Um, I've talked about, you know, the night skies that we can see at Great Basin, but also the fact that you don't need to travel to Eastern Nevada to see those night skies. You can see them in your backyard. And in order to see them best, and in order to have your neighbors see them best, you can start reducing your light footprint, turning off outside lights when you don't need them. And as you do so, more and more stars will be visible. You may even get a chance to see a shooting star or a satellite or the North Star. And so while that brings us to the end of what I have to tell you, I'd love to answer any sort of questions that you have. And I just wanna thank you for, you know, listening. Um, it's been a pleasure sharing the park with you. Oh, one question I wanted to ask, cause it was a little bit back and it was a question on our LED light better for the night sky than maybe like a normal light bulb or something like that? Would that be a better choice or is that still too bright? That's actually not typically a good choice. Now, LEDs are interesting because most of the ones that we're used to have this bluish white light and bluish white light is exactly what we want to avoid. We don't like the color blue for light pollution. 
but there are these things called warm LEDs. Um, for the adults in the audience, it's anything below about 3000 Kelvin when measuring the temperature of a bulb. And warm LEDs are all right, but you don't want cold LEDs, the ones that are blue. Ask your question. Why is the North Star point in point in North? Oh, that's such a good question. So just to repeat it, the question was, why is the North Star pointing north? Uh, and the answer is because the Earth rotates and the Earth basically just spins in a circle. Now, it spins in a circle where it's spinning and then there's the North Pole at the top of that ball that's spinning in the South Pole at the bottom. You can almost imagine it, like there's this big stick and the Earth is spinning around that. And that stick goes through the North Pole and through due north. But if you extend that stick into space, you would hit the North Star. It's what we call our axis of rotation. And the North Star is directly on our axis of rotation. And so that means even as we spin and everything else in the night sky rotates to us, that North Star always stays on our axis of rotation. It always stays pointing exactly due north. From Allison, a couple, uh, a couple uh, chats up. What has been your favorite part about being at Great Basin this summer? Oh goodness, I think my favorite part of being at Great Basin this summer, first it was seeing the dark night skies on my own, but since then it's seeing everybody else getting to see night skies this dark for the first time. Um, it really does kind of strike something in you. Um, it's just a, a sense of awe and it's been really, really incredible getting to see that in other people. All right, and we have another question from Kate, which is when is the earliest comet shower in the year? Uh, would like to take kids, but mid-morning is too late. All right, so meteor showers. Um, so just to clarify, comets are actually totally different from meteors, but meteors are what we think of as shooting stars. And I think the question would make sense as meteor showers. And the answer is that mid-morning is too late, even for me, uh, mid-morning being like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. But all of the meteor showers we talk about when we say they peak at 3 a.m., that just means you may see a few more meteors at 3 a.m., but the moment it gets dark, you'll still be able to see them. Um, so rather than considering when they peak earlier, or I should say like closer to when the sun sets, um, I would still just go out whenever you see that there's a meteor shower and the Perseids, uh, which peak on August 12th to 13th, are going to be one of your best bets for the summer. So the moment it gets dark out, find a dark place, look up, and you should see a bunch of shooting stars. All right. So Nicole asks, is there a dark skies finder resource anywhere? And I think that's a great question because, um, like I said, I don't know everywhere geographically in the world about dark skies, but there absolutely is. So if you Google online and you search for either um, a light pollution map or even just search for dark sky parks in whatever state you're in, there will be them. And there will be resources online for where dark skies exist. So I would either search for, just search like light pollution map Nevada, if I were in Nevada, or I would search dark sky parks Nevada and that would tell me places I can go. Um, all right, I'm happy to keep answering questions. Vicki, how are we doing on time? Let's do two more questions, Serena, and then we will okay. wrap it up. Sounds good. All right, so I am going to answer questions in order of when they were asked. So I think the next one I have not answered is, when did I know or when did you know I wanted to study stars? Um, the answer is always. Um, so I always loved stars, even when I was growing up surrounded by light pollution. I was always really interested in them, but I think I knew when I got the chance to see the darker stars out um, in an international dark sky park, actually at Bryce Canyon National Park, when I was about 10 and I was like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I just want to keep learning about them. And I did, and I haven't stopped since. Um, and another question is, what is the altitude at Great Basin? Is it high up like Denver? The answer is it's actually higher up than Denver. 
Um, so Denver is at about 6,000 feet above sea level. Right now I'm sitting at 6,800 feet above sea level, but we have a mountain that goes up to 13,000 feet above sea level. And the bristlecone pine tree you see in this picture right there is at about 11,000 feet above sea level. Um, and that was those two questions. So I believe that brings us to the end of questions. Yes, but, yeah. thank you so much. That was great. That was awesome.